Okay, great. So uh, you're here listening to the One Door Podcast, Free Your Mind, with Richard Schweitzer. Uh, today we're going to be talking to Tim Heffernan, the Deputy Commissioner or a Deputy Commissioner at the New South Wales Mental Health Commission. Um, I would like to make some acknowledgements. I'd like to acknowledge the tradi traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge all people with lived experience of mental illness as we work together towards a world in which people with mental illness are valued and treated as equals. So welcome to uh, Free Your Mind, Tim. It's very, it's great that you can be here. Thanks, Richard. It's lovely to be here. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to stroke your ego a little. Uh, I've got some information about some of the projects that you've been involved in over time. Um, I hope that's okay. Yeah. Tim has been a Deputy Commissioner at the New South Wales Mental Health Commission since December 2018. And before that was a member of the Commissioner's Community Advisory Council from its establishment in 2014. He's an experienced consumer peer worker and is a past chair of Being, New South Wales Consumer Advisory Group, and the New South Wales Public Mental Health Consumer Workers Committee. He's a co-chair of the National Mental Health Commission's National Stigma and Discrimination Reduction Strategy Steering Committee and deputy co-chair of the National Peer Workforce Development Guidelines Steering Committee. Tim, who is the real Tim Heffernan? Who is the real Tim Heffernan? Well, that's that's an interesting one. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, a person who, who was born on the Murrumbidgee River at Hay um, back a few decades now, Richard, and who um, over my life has um, lived in small towns and um, ended up in growing up in Wagga, um, uh, where I began my teaching career. So I sort of began my professional life as a teacher, but very early on in, in that career, a combination of personal experiences, relationships, fa family, deaths and world events Ar around 1983, two years into my teaching career, I developed um, uh, a um, hypermania, I suppose, following on from probably a depression, which put me into the mental health system at the end of 1983. So I've always had that that lens of um of 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 being in contact i suppose with um mental health services and having that experience of i've probably moved away from mental illness there you know i was initially diagnosed um with um paranoid schizophrenia which was changed to manic depression which was then reworded as bipolar one mood disorder um I, I tend to think a lot of our what happens to us is a, is a response to a very complex world and and our individual framing and response to that world can be can be quite different yeah yeah so um, um and quite important so really I'm a combination of many things I now live in Wollongong I'm married with two lovely adult um, daughters I feel very privileged um, in a lot of ways in a in a world of uh, a great deal of um of lack of privilege and um yeah i'm trying to enjoy life as a person who works in mental health um as a person who enjoys doing some writing from time to time and and um promoting that intersection of the arts and and, and mental health yeah so you mentioned you had two daughters uh one of them is an artist is that right sorry my, uh, one of my daughters is um is a uh she she's a, an actor and okay. she's um uh lucy and she's been involved in in uh study of of acting a theater uh, through the wollongong uni here uh and various theater experiences and is now in the uh, process of preparing to head off to edinburgh shortly for the edinburgh fringe festival for a a little play that she's um, one woman musical expose called Party Girl that she's put together, um, yeah. which is quite exciting. Yeah. And we're going to go over and, and, and watch her. You mentioned that you've accessed mental health services 
and uh, one door is, as you know, a mental health uh, service provider. Could you maybe give me some insight into some of the challenges that you experienced or maybe some of the benefits you experienced in the mental health service? Um, <clears throat> look, I think it's it's a, well, for everyone, it's a, a mixed bag. Um, my first admission was to um, a public mental health um, facility in Wagga, which was very much just an adjunct to the general hospital. And it was um, fairly open and not too restrictive. Uh, people could go out into the gardens and 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 um, and and move in and out of the ward and have visitors quite quite well. Um, but then I I did become unwell a couple of years later and entered a different sort of public mental health system, which was at Kenmore Hospital in Goulburn, which was the first one I went in voluntary because I thought I needed to uh, have a place to. Um, a place of um, refuge, a place of asylum, I suppose, to protect me from um, a hostile world. I thought the world was going to end unless I lived past my um, 23rd birthday at that time. It was ringing Ronald Reagan and Star Wars and and all that Cold War crisis at the time, which, which was really at a heightened state. But my second admission to Kenmore was as an involuntary patient a couple of times. And, and being transported from Wagga to, to Goulburn um, involved uh, things that I had not experienced before in terms of that coercive um, use of force in terms of restraints. Um, I was restrained on the journey from Wagga to Goulburn in the foyer of Gundagai Hospital by about five or six people and sedated for the rest of the trip. And then in that hospital, it was very sectioned off into an acute section and a, a general ward and um, while you're in acute you were meant to stay in bed and and follow some rules and do things and which was very hard when you were a little bit uh, manic mm. so um, again it was characterized by a lot of use of coercive restraints sedation and also seclusion um, so you know it's been uh that 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 sort of um, experience meant that I avoided mental health services for twenty years. Went back to teaching. Decided with my advice from my doctors that lithium would be a good thing to use. So I, I religiously took that, monitored that with my GP, um, and did all that until I left teaching in two thousand and five and became unwell again and re-entered the system. Mm -hmm. But it was one that. Initially, those first experiences, or, or the ones in Goulburn, especially at Kenmore, were ones that frightened me considerably and made me very fearful of seeking treatment. And um, uh, so I, I tended to avoid it. So um, mostly I've, I've had interactions in managing my health through my GP. Mm -hmm. I think has been my primary point of contact to always make sure I've got a GP who's very good with mental health, who can do a mental health care plan. Um, then as needed over times, I've had, you know, um, interactions with psychiatrists, which may be uh, more frequent around at the after an admission and then tapering off l largely to where I don't see one. Mm -hmm. Um I've not really used um, services like One Door. I've, I've spent a lot of time working with people in those settings, in the non-government organisation settings, and I've certainly spent time at One Door in Wollongong um, working with people and, and, and assisting people to, say, access the NDIS um, through the services that One Door has there or to access the, um, um, you know, the, the groups that they have there. So... Um, I think, you know, we need a range of different ways people can um, support their own well-being by engaging in, in in the things that they value and that they choose. Well, well thank you for talking to me about, about mental health services and your experiences, because I know it's not always easy. Um, mm. I, I share with you, uh, I see a GP very regularly. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's very important for my care. 
Um, you're a deputy commissioner at the Mental Health Commission. Can you tell us a bit about what that's like? Well, you know, I think the commission, which came into being through an act of parliament in 2012 and really kicked off about 2014, 13, 14, was set up um, with part of its legislation that one of the commissioners or deputy commissioners must have a lived experience of mental illness. Mm-hmm. And, and that's quite significant in, in, in itself, but also in the direction it gives to the rest of the sector in um, showing how important it is to have people in designated lived experience roles at, at the top levels of organisations Mm-hmm. And throughout organisations, um, and not s- simply as um, as as sort of the frontline workforce. That frontline workforce is incredibly important, and I've been a peer worker for over a decade. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it does it does make it a significant point. So when I was first with the commission, it was with the Consumer Advisory Council. So we did a lot of work with the commission around developing the Living Well Strategic Plan for 2014 to 2024. So it's um, really, um, you know, lapsing this year and a new new planning cycle will be beginning. Um, and that plan is, is really the government's plan to... Um, uh, for for mental health, public mental health services, and it influences. So the commission really is set up to to um, lead the reform agenda, to to give guidance, to to innovate, innovate, but also review what's going on. Um, you know, evaluate what's going on, and look at look at how we support the well being of of people. So a lot of a lot of work has been around um, that. Uh, what do you call it? health promotion i suppose where all of the deputies in in our communities and in in the state will take on a a front-facing role where we might um, be involved in leading projects or or involved in consultations in in the community to come up with some of those plans or to or to speak on specific issues at specific um events um so a few years ago i had the pleasure of, of speaking at the one door symposium Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's a combination of things. It's about you know always about about presenting um, the work of the commission, but you know what 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 is most important in my work and and all people with lived experience is how we utilize our own personal lived experience of mental health issues and recovery, mm-hmm. but also that collective wisdom mm-hmm. that that comes from the consumer or the lived experience movement around people's experiences of of um of human rights violations of of of, of exclusion um and discrimination social justice issues you know lived experience workers and that includes me as a commissioner deputy commissioner we are here to try and to seek to transform systems, and through the commission, I think my mo- most of my work has been focused on, on, on enabling transformation of of mental health systems through the lived experience peer workforce, and and growing that. So the commission's been great in supporting uh, that growth. Mm-hmm. We we um, um, have have done a lot there, and working with New South Wales Health and the NGO sector. To to really um, yeah support and and grow that that workforce as as I um, sometimes working in conjunction with traditional biomedical clinical workforces but also more and more um, being there as something unique and even alternative in terms of the way we can provide support for people and you know there are evidence of that in the way people work together saying things like um with clinical teams so you know you've got your peer supported transfer of care workers in mental health um services now where they're working um with with consumers from that point of view coming from hospital into the community bringing them into places like one door or into places where they recover and also places then like the say the safe havens where where you have really more of a peer-led model where people are coming to a place 
that is different to their experiences of seeking help at an emergency department when they're feeling mental health distress or suicidality. We've been talking about working with lived experience and the the title of this uh, podcast is uh, A Day in the Life of a Peer Worker. Mm. Uh, Give us in, in in a short sentence, what is a peer worker? What does a peer worker do? Yeah, look, we had um, um, a big discussion around, uh, well, this this informed the development of the um, national, uh, what are called the National Mental Health Lived Experience Peer Workforce Development Guidelines. So, you know, they came out in uh, 22, 23, and were really led by um, Dr. Louise Byrne and her team from RMIT, and I was happy happened to share um, the co-chairing of that um, steering committee with uh, Margaret Doherty, who was working from the carer peer worker angle. So we came up with the ter- with that term after after extensive consultations around, you know, formerly people were called consumer workers, peer workers. My first job title was a consumer rehabilitation assistant. Um, there are there are lots, and there still are lots of different ways we we refer to ourselves, we call ourselves consumer advocates, we call ourselves educators, we call ourselves like yourself, you're a a consumer researcher, um, and um, those titles. So with the guidelines, we we use the overarching term of lived experience peer worker to encompass all designated lived experience roles. So it would include my role as a deputy commissioner, which is a designated role, would still fit under that that broad spectrum but that allows then people to choose the titles that they want uh people themselves and organizations for their workforce so we have emerging terms like peer navigators as well coming out um i think in the stage have terms like peer bridges but it's you know that's referring to the the specific type of work that we're doing and you know traditionally the peer workforce, the change, I suppose, in language to lived experience was to reflect that there was a perception that peer support was the in workforce was the entire domain of peer work, mm-hmm. whereas we're pointing out that it is a really important part of it, but it's not the complete the complete set. And and you know we've started off with mental health peer workers because we've had peer work emerge over time, you know, from the consumer movement where people voluntarily supported each other when they were coming out of institutions into a fairly hostile and unsupportive world, Mm -hmm. into into this, um, you know, place of peer support, peer work, peer specialists, peer navigators, whatever. So um, bringing with us that that experience of discrimination and and, um, uh, those experiences of coercion and having our rights taken away from us. But more and more, we're looking at specialised areas of peer work too and how they fit in. So we have suicide prevention, peer workers, the peer workforce, we have alcohol and other drugs, peer workforce. We're moving into places like complex um, health conditions or chronic health conditions where peer work people support each other in those spaces. Now they're different to mental health peer workers, but there's there are shared similarities, and you know it's an exciting time where we come together and support each other from our different specialization or our different perspectives. So I was going to ask you uh, who can benefit from peer work, but you've mentioned a number of groups: people with alcohol and drug uh, issues, and uh, people with mental health issues people exiting the mental health system into the community. So um, I'll skip that question. Is there an art to being a peer worker? You know, I think the art the art is in, um, you know, you, you, we're in this job to work for the benefit of others and, and for the goals and aspirations of, of, of people who are, who are on that recovery journey, who are coming sometimes from a place of no hope to, to a place of hope. So one of the arts is, is, is to, to be able to hold hope for people 
and but allow them to take it back and to move forward. So, you know, the art is being with people. Um, it's about being ourselves being authentic in, in, in who we are, where we've come and being able to share parts of our journey with people, but always recognising, I think, that it's the journey of the person we're working with at that time, um, and it would be multiple people um, in, in any workforce that you're working with, that it's it's their goals and aspirations and and, and how, how they want to move towards a, a life that's more meaningful. So it's working with people in a lot of ways, it's anti-mental health system. We're trying to get people ultimately out of the mental health system mm. into lives where where they're in more control, where they're more autonomous, where they're living where they want to live, where if they're working, they're working where they want to live, that where they have families. Um, you know, those choices that people, everybody wants, and but also having um you know, that they have access to the type of support that, that they need. I think um, we often see, and we've seen recently, um, some, you know, instances of where people we've met with have come to the attention of, um, of our society through, I suppose, being isolated and um, not connected and... And often, I think that's when some of the, um, the 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 issues that develop around psychosis and and thinking uh, can uh, can get out of line if you're not connected to things. And I think you know peer work more than anything allows people to to have ongoing connections. I you know I've just this week been to the Hearing Voices group here in Wollongong. We've been doing that group for over um, over a decade now. It's run by a, a person who hears voices, but it's it's a place where people can come to and talk about their experiences and be connected, and and work through things that are difficult because you know for them, their experiences of voice hearing don't magically disappear because they're on medication. You know, they're, they're, a lot of people. Some people that happens, but a lot of people have ongoing experiences, and and need to be able to lead a life, often with with those um, what we call symptoms um, mm. there. You know, so it's it's about again that group's about peer support. It's about people not having to um, go off to hospital, up their medication, to to cope with things. It's about okay, let's let's work through this together. And I, I really love uh, the whole idea of um, peer-led services, alternative um, spaces like like um, like the Hearing Voices Network provides. Yeah, I, I have interest in Hearing Voices Networks too. I think there are an interesting alternative to psychotropic mm. medication. Do you think, I mean, I guess one of the principles of hearing voices networks is that people learn to have a different relationship with their voices and um, come, I guess, come to terms and accept them. Do you think that this kind of living with symptoms is something that can go, that can occur for other symptoms of schizophrenia, for example? Look, um, you know, there are, there are all sorts of diagnostic terms around, you know, around people will talk about fixed delusions and things like that, where people are constantly working with uh, a reality that other people don't recognise or a set of beliefs that other people don't recognise as being real, but it's very real to the person. And, and, and I think it's an incredibly important area to 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 explore because i think a lot of that does does need a really um big um look at you know not how we can you know again there's an important role for medication i think um that's that's given and 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 primarily in that acute phase but if people have ongoing symptoms then you know i think it's about exploring exploring with them um 
aspects of their lives you know with the hearing voices group you have the maastricht interview which which can uh, um and and voice dialogues that some people do our group's just a, is a support group where we talk very generally about that and give information about about other things um you know personally myself with my diagnosis um where, where i s- switch into a psychosis which is about um moving from a imperfect world to a perfect world which is hook, hooks into my upbringing as a catholic and all that you know sort of thing you know and i'll i'll switch into um the rapture you know suddenly i'll be in a place where where the world is perfect and that, and and I'm, then I, then i chuff off to hospital because at the same time i'm not sleeping i'm i'm um behaving erratically and 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 uh, i'm a pain in the backside to my family um and I, I I go to hospital to sleep, and those symptoms will subside. But it doesn't mean I don't, you know, have a an ongoing desire to work towards a more peaceful planet um, and things like that. So, but you know, I, um, the people who come to the group and the people who access services like One Doors and uh, One Door, you know, people some people have quite intrusive symptoms happening quite regularly mm. and and but they have a right to be in the community you know and and it's about how how we don't i think there's a danger in hiding those things and not talking about them and not allowing people to be open about them or fearful that they'll you know be punished by going to hospital because they they talk talk about their experiences so it's a um it's a, you know i think um a lot of people from my my experience have symptoms where they feel relieved to be able to just talk about how they're feeling rather than you know, and not f- fear that they're going to um, have an increase in their medication or an admission to hospital so you know i don't know what do you what do you think richard what what how do you feel about that one well, look uh, a while back i was involved in a SBS production called You Can't Ask That about mm. schizophrenia. And one of the things that struck me is that a lot of the people that they had on the show, apart from me, um, were living with voices mm. um, and not always with kind voices. Mm. Yeah. But they were living with them and they were, you know, able to get into a studio and talk cogently and coherently about what was mm. happening to them. Um I think having space to discuss what you're experiencing with someone else who has had a similar experience is probably a beneficial thing. Yeah, I'd agree. I should, I did see that. That was a, a great, a great program. You did very well. well thank you. Um, so back to peer work. I there are a few more questions I'd like to ask you. If that's okay. Yeah. Um, is there a political will to support peer work? Um, yes. Um, you know, I think I think um, since the 90s, the early 90s, with the first National Mental Health Plan and before that with the Richmond Report and the Burdekin Inquiry, um, you, we, we have seen that, um, th- that the system, the mental health system is imperfect and um, some people will call it broken. Some people will say that it's designed that way. But um, the reform agenda, I think, began formally in the 90s in Australia with the National Mental Health Plans and moved through um, a movement from consumer and care participation to this, this understanding of um, the potential for the workforce to, to be central to um, two things. And you know, I think, as I said, we've we've come from being called consumer workers to being peer workers, and we're part of an international movement. Mm-hmm. So that's very important. I think, um, as, as I mentioned before, the Mental Health Commission, which is a statutory um, mental health body, um, which reports to the minister, uh, we have have um, really tried to strengthen um, peer work. You'll notice we have you know we have peak bodies in new south wales and other states um which are for consumers which also 
support politically peer work and um, you will be aware of the f uh, funding and uh, formation of the new two new peak bodies for consumers and carers well, was kind um, of that, that was announced yeah recently um, I think they had a, a ceremony on on Monday at Parliament House to to name the National Consumer Peak Consumer Alliance as the consumer body responsible for that development but um you also have then working specifically on peer work for a long time we've been um, um, petitioning government I suppose for a uh, an overarching professional association uh, which has been funded in the last Commonwealth budget so that will enable the peer workforce to, to take more intentional and direct, um, control over over the things and collective control over the the ways we work, how we want to work, um, you know what sort of trainings, professional development, what sort of awards we want to have, and that will enable what's been difficult over time. It, you know, you have peer workers happening in public mental health space, you have peer workers happening in um, in uh, Wandor, Flourish, Wellways, Nemai but a place where we can come together better and understand that we can we can work together i think and that's the best thing to do we also have had through the primary health networks an organization called the mental health lived experience engagement network which has been really important in terms of getting peer work going in in those primary health network funded services and you have um you have uh, then, um, like in my area here in southeastern New South Wales, we've formed peer networks which meet regularly across all, all services to support each other, engage in professional development and do things uh, together. So it's it's about, um, I, you know, the political part of it is, is to say, yes, we can work. We're an important workforce. We were one of the priority workforces in the National Mental Health Workforce Strategy. Um, and so we're seen now as, as being uh, an absolutely essential part of the mental health workforce, but we're still working to to get to the scale that we that we need. I apologise for my dog barking. I'm babysitting an old dog today, so and okay. um, he, he sometimes gets stuck, so I might have to go out in a minute and uh, just okay. see if he's all right. That's sometimes. So we might have to put, we might have to pause it just for a minute so I can go and check on him. Oh, well, we're almost finished. Okay. So uh, you talked about the peak bodies for consumers and carers. I was going to ask you about that, but that's um, something that's happening. Um, I know you're, amongst other things, a poet, and I was wondering whether you might happen to have any poetry with you that you could share with us. Well, because you flagged this, I happen to have um, a couple of pieces. Um I'll do do one I haven't done before, which because I've talked a little bit about that movement into um, into into a delusional psychosis, which is part of my my condition with um, with bipolar one, mm. and which which led to when I first became unwell. You know, the dominant symptom when I went into hospital the initial time was the psychosis, so they were looking at. Um, at, at, at an initial diagnosis of schizophrenia and as I said it changed but as I also said I think there's a continuum of things and I'm not really a big fan of of diagnosis too too much so this piece is called On the Ladder um, Richard mm -hmm. and it was published in a, um, a book um, put out by a, a publisher called Spineless Wonders they have a, a competition each year and um which leads to the award of the joanne burns um prize joanne burns is one of our major prose poets so it's a prose poetry and microfiction is the um is 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 what this this book looks at which um so this is called on the ladder <clears throat> the first writing ended in madness but for 20 years, the words stayed in your head, trying to find shapes that would speak. This time you returned to drafts of delusion, but the drafts of delusion return you to this time. On the ladder, you think of what to write, the second coming. 
At that precise moment, the words, the music and the man melt. Meaning meets you and you understand the pulse of the place, the beating of hearts, the chorus of uncertainty, the construction from nothing, the coming back to fix the temple, the houses of sticks, the clutching of straws, the building with beaks. Sometimes when the writing is good and the music is too, it is like you are wired. As you listen, the melody, the lyric prompts you, supports you, sings your sentence, and the breeze pushes you, gives you direction, tells you which way to go, which path to follow. The breeze breathes. So that's that end. Thank you very much. Tim, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And uh, Lovely to see you again, Richard. You're doing fabulous work, so please keep it up. Um, retirement beckons, <laughs> we'll <laughs> see how long. But no, it's great to great to go. And thanks for um, thinking of me for your wonderful podcast series, okay? It's a pleasure. Have a great day. Great. See ya. Bye-bye.